Hi, everyone. Um, I still see the count of the participants coming in, but I think we're going to start now. Um, so my name is Dennis Lau, and I'm a senior science advisor for the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey here at the National Center for Health Statistics. Hi, everyone. Welcome from NCHS. I am Namina Luwalia, Nutrition Monitoring Advisor for NHANES. It's our pleasure to coordinate today's webinar, Population-Based Survey Experience in Multimode Health and Nutrition Data Collection. We have a very interesting lineup, including expert presentations and a panel discussion with QA. So we look forward to engaging with you all and thank you again for joining us. So today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you can stay on to just listen in or you can disconnect anytime. During this webinar, the audience will remain in listen mode only. If you have any questions, you can write them into the Zoom Q&A box anytime during the webinar. Please make sure to include which speaker you'd like to answer your question. For those who'd like to view live captioning of today's presentation, please go to the link on this slide. We're also going to drop the link into the chat for your convenience. And now to kick us off, I'll turn it over to the director of the National Center for Health Statistics, Dr. Ma Brian Moyer. Thanks so much, Dennis. So good afternoon and, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of NCHS, I'm delighted that you all are joining us for, uh, for today's webinar. As many of you know, NCHS is the nation's principal health statistics agency. We compile health data and statistics to inform the public and guide public health program and policy decisions to improve the nation's health. NHANES is an extremely important program at NCHS because unlike any other national health survey, NHANES combines data from standardized interviews, physical examinations, and laboratory testing of biospecimens to produce national prevalence on a wide range of health indicators. These indicators include acute and chronic health conditions, nutritional status, physical activity, and exposure to environmental hazards. Today's webinar will touch on two topics that are especially relevant to NCHS's strategic priorities, innovation and health equity. Our current priorities include exploring ways to modernize NCHS's surveys that will generate new and expanded data and analysis. And we will allow this work to inform those health discrepancies and it will also allow us to better track progress towards greater health equity in the United States. I'm very much looking forward to today's webinar and hearing about these and other very exciting topics. I wanna to thank each of you for joining today's discussion. And I also want to thank the NHANES staff here at NCHS for making this event possible. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Carolyn Green, NCHS's Principal Deputy Director, for some additional thoughts and opening remarks. Carolyn? Thank you, Brian. Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here today, and I'm delighted to be uh, helping to facilitate the discussion later on in, in the webinar. Health and nutrition examination surveys are near and dear to me. From 2008 to 2014, I served first as an assistant uh, commissioner and then as a deputy commissioner at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. During my time there, one of my largest uh, collaborative projects that I worked on was the New York City Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Uh, I served as the co-principal investigator of NYC Haynes until I left the department when my then colleague and now good friend, Cheryl, Sharon Perlman, who you'll hear from later today, took on that role. Even though I worked on NYC Haynes a decade ago, I'll say that some of the challenges that we grappled with then are the same as the challenges we face in uh, population-based multi-mode health surveys today, whether that's how to increase participation rate, how to identify and secure resources needed, 
uh, or how to engage communities from the start. So today I very much look forward to hearing from and learning from our uh, experienced panelists um, on these topics and more. So thank you all for joining. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Alan Simon, who serves as our director in the Division of Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys here at NCHS. Alan? Thanks, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. So I'm Alan Simon. I'm the NHANES director here at NCHS. Uh, and I just want to start by um, welcoming you all and thanking you all for coming. Uh, this is an incredibly important webinar for us. Uh, you know, it's it's really an opportunity. We were recently on the phone with our friends from the Canadian Health Measure Survey, and I think somebody said, there's really nothing else like our surveys. And I, I said, well, actually, there are other surveys like our surveys out there. Uh, we just, you know, we just really, uh, while we talk with them individually from time to time, we really haven't had the opportunity before to bring everybody together. And we're just about to have this fantastic opportunity. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important for us because there's just a lot that we think we can learn um, from each other uh, about the best ways to, uh, you know, tackle all the problems that we see and, and how to innovate and how to, how to do more than we've done in the past. Um, you know, and I think it's also uh, going to allow us to come up with the ideas about um, how to expand and grow. And also there might be opportunities that we can identify for how we can collaborate in the future. Um, so we're just uh, incredibly thankful that you're all here and we're really looking forward to, to hearing from every one of you. Um, so thank you again, and I will turn it back to Dennis. Thanks, Alan. So on the screen, you can see today's agenda. Uh, next, we'll have a plenary session where NHANES and three other community-based programs will describe their survey activities and key achievements. We start with our national survey program, NHANES. Then we'll have the Rural Cohort Study, a multi-state, multi-rural area research program presented by the faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio and University of Alabama, Birmingham. Next, we'll have SHOW, a multi-city state level program presented by faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And finally, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene will present New York City Haynes, New York City Health Panel and their COVID-19 zero survey. And Haynes has a, had a rich history of providing technical consultation to many state and local programs, including these three programs. We are very fortunate to have them joining us today. During the uh, plenary session at 2.20, there will be a brief interruption when the National Emergency Alert System is tested for all, on all cell phones. Uh, we may take a short pause at that time until the alert goes away. After the plenary session, We'll have a short break and move on to a panel discussion and a Q&A session where we'll have more in-depth discussions with our presenters. Remember, as audience, you can submit your questions into the Q&A box throughout this entire webinar. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Naman to speak about Anne Haynes. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. While Whitney's loading my slides, I would like to thank everyone again. And I will say that it's my privilege to represent Anne Haynes and talk to you about Anne Haynes' past, present, and its near future in this quick journey today together. And I would like to highlight our accomplishments on the way as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. And Haynes is a series of cross-sectional surveys conducted by National Center for Health Statistics CDC, we have a broad goal to assess the health and nutritional status of adults and children in the United States. Next slide. Our mission is to produce population-based and large group level estimates and trends over time on what I call four pillars of enhanced health conditions, environmental exposures, infectious disease, and nutritional status. We also maintain a biospecimen program. Next slide. 
Here's a little bit of NHANES history. We started as a health examination survey, NHES, in early 60s, and we were expanded uh, to become NHANES by shifting the focus from health to health and nutrition in early 70s. We also covered a broad age range since then. And Haynes was repeated in various ways and uh, through mid 90s with one cycle dedicated to Hispanics. One big milestone was in 1999, we became continuous. So we call ourselves now continuous and Haynes because A, we cover all ages, but more importantly, we've been collecting data continuously without breaks, releasing those data collected for every two year and in cycle. Exception came when COVID hit us and we had to pull out in March of 2020. That's when we stopped data collection. But we went back in the field in August, 2021 successfully to start a new cycle. Next slide, please. And we recently finished that cycle in August, 2023. Now, NHANE sample is, consists of civilian, non-institutionalized U.S. population. We examine 5,000 people, persons every year and release data on about 10,000 folks in every two-year cycle. We oversampled certain groups in the past and they are listed here. But more importantly, in the last cycle that we just recently finished our last two-year cycle in uh, August 2023, thanks to all who worked on it, there was no oversampling based on race or ethnicity. However, age was considered for recruitment. Next slide, please. And Hinz uses a complex four-stage design to select a nationally representative sample. Next slide. And Hinz Max travels from rural to urban areas covering uh, plains to mountains. And more importantly, Despite all these, you know, traffic, season, all these uh, challenges we face prior to going to every primary sampling unit, during advanced arrangements, our staff works very hard on establishing uh, and involving local county and public health officials and community leaders, uh, such as health departments, law enforcement officers, religious leaders, to engage the communities for successfully recruiting our participants. Next, please. And his data collection, next slide please, begins with a knock at the doorstep. And that's where we identify eligible participants. Once consented, uh, folks have provided consent, a home interview is conducted to collect participants' data on several items listed here, including demographics, health conditions, healthcare, medication, dietary supplement use, as well as food insecurity, to name a few. After that, a uh, visit to mobile exam center here on Max is scheduled. This is where we collect comprehensive health information as well as biospecimens and further interviews, including a dietary recall. Next, this is followed by a telephone call to obtain the second dietary recall. And in the past, as well as further follow-up studies. In the past, those follow-up studies have included physical activity monitor, 24-hour urine collection, antigen testing for TB, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is a picture scenario for the MAC. The MAC exam provides a standardized environment for collected, collecting automated data collection on a variety of health measures. Upon check-in, at the reception, the participants undergo various exams based on their age and gender. The top three, anthropometry, DEXA scan, and blood pressure have been measured every, every cycle. And, oh, I'm sorry, I was slow. I was going a bit fast for time. But, uh, um, so the three top row things, anthropometry, DEXA scan, blood pressure are measured in every cycle. And the pictures shown below are various aspects of health that come in and come out of different cycles based on data needs and funding available. Next slide, please. Our max updated with a state-of-the-art lab to collect, process, and analyze even for some basic tests. Samples collected vary by age and survey year, and blood samples are obtained for ages one year and older. 
we measure about 500 analytes each cycle. Next slide, please. And here are the examples of all the vast array of tests we do on each of the four pillars I mentioned previously. Next slide, please. NHANES has been monitoring nutrition of the nation for over 50 years. We use a comprehensive state-of-the-art textbook assessment from biochemical measures, anthropometric measurements, dietary intake, and supplements intake, as well as folks' nutrition knowledge and behaviors. And I would like to mention, since 2021, both dietary intake and dietary supplement use data are collected over the phone, and we continue, we will continue with that in 2025 as well. Next slide, please. Now, NHANES adapts its protocols to stay flexible and innovative. This is to respond to emerging public health concerns and to address research needs and recommendations. Here are a few examples from over the last 10 years or so. And um, to, to show you the examples from 2019-2020 cycle are highlighted in green text on the left-hand side. And you will see in this cycle, we collected water samples, salt samples at home. We brought back certain tests such as oral HPV dance, and we shifted to using blood pressure by automated devices uh, uh, at the MAC. And then we also expanded our questionnaire content on birth 24 months in that cycle, and that has continued on into the current cycle and probably 2025 as well. I would like to mention that we do conduct some special studies. The last one we did was National Youth Fitness Study in 2012 to assess fitness and physical activity of youth. Next slide, please. And his releases its data for every two-year cycle on its website. And these are uh, done in numerous files, which are public use files, freely downloadable for researchers, and we encourage you to use them. And the second way we release our data is limited access data, and that's available upon request through the Research Data Center. We also have online tutorials and documentation on our site for folks to use and use our data well. Next slide, please. And hence data have been linked to various external sources via our wonderful NCHS data linkage program. Here are a few examples. For instance, linking NHINS data to National Data Index, that index allows researchers to have a longitudinal passive follow-up of our participants and to examine associations with mortality. Similarly, linking our data, which is available to our uh, website, of course, these linked data. Um, so NHINS link data to other programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, HUD allows folks to examine associations with social determinants of health, a topic of interest to many. Next slide, please. Let's shift gears now to talk about NHANES key accomplishments in these past 50 years and mostly for more from our recent 10 years or so. Next slide, please. We are known for delivering nationally representative statistics on prevalence of chronic disease, conditions both diagnosed that people already know about, as well as undiagnosed and using objective measurements. Next slide. Here we show that the on the right-hand side, the prevalence of total diabetes as well as diagnosed diabetes is increasing over time, has increased over time. And on the left, our data show that diabetes prevalence is lowest among non-Hispanic whites. Next slide, please. This slide shows the relationship of obesity. We are very well known for our data on obesity with sociodemographic variables, in particular on this slide, family income. And on the right-hand side, obesity data over time, trends show that obesity continues to increase among adults. Next slide, please. However, we do have some encouraging news for the United States, and that is based on our lab data. Here in the line, the line in green, you can see that the prevalence of high total cholesterol level is consistently declining. 
Next slide, please. We also deliver nationally representative statistics on the other three pillars that I mentioned before, and I'll give you a few examples next. Next slide, please. Okay, NHANES data are used to monitor the prevalence of infectious diseases, including sexually transmitted diseases in the US and informing vaccination and immunization policies. Here are some analyses on hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and COVID in the last cycle. And you can see that the percentage of adults uh, with the hep C was lowest among those who had private insurance on the right uh, bar chart compared to those who had public insurance or no insurance. Again, very important information, insurance coverage to NHANES. Next slide, please. We are all very much interested in knowing more about what we are being exposed to in today's context, environment talks, uh, environmental hazards like Brian mentioned in his introduction. And means collect over 400 analytes every cycle of chemicals that we are exposed to via air, water, food, et cetera. And these data inform various super important critical CDC reports shown here. And more recently, our biomonitoring CDC colleagues uh, update tables online at the site provided below. So you can go on that site and with a few clicks, you can have information on any environmental toxic chemical that we are measuring among those 400 with a few clicks. Thanks to our CDC biomonitoring program colleagues. Next slide, please. Uh, here we show that environmental exposures have been related to important health aspects. If, for example, folks who eat more home prepared meals or more meals at home have lower levels of harmful PFAS in their blood. Similarly, blood levels have been associated with impairments or changes, altered bone mineral density in youth. Next slide, please. And his dietary data are very important to describe what Americans eat. And this component we do in partnership with USDA. Uh, and here we show that breakfast consumption and fruit and vegetable consumption among US adults is high. However, more than one third of youth consume fast food on any given day. Next slide. Using our data uh, on nutrition knowledge and behaviors, we recently showed that mm, only 25% of US adults are aware of the MyPlate tool. This is USDA's nutrition education slash translation. And if you go back to the previous slide, Of those 25% who've heard of my plate, only 33% have tried to follow these recommendations, pointing a big gap in translation. And our colleagues are now working further to, to address this in USDA and other agencies. Next slide, please. Our data are critical to set reference standards for anthropometry, for bone mineral density, lab tests as well, and our data are used to develop and update pediatric growth charts. Next slide. And these dietary data in conjunction with lab data and lab markers of nutrition are critical to inform setting and tracking of food fortification policies involving folic acid, iron, and iodine. And our data have shown that effectiveness of these policies in practically eradicating these deficiencies for the most part in the United States. These data are con continually used to inform progress on healthy people objectives as well. Next slide, please. And nutrition data are also important in informing critical iconic nutrition policies shown here, namely the nutrition label, we inform the usual portion sizes for nutrition label. Our data are used to revise the Thrifty Food Plan, which is such an important tool basis for determining SNAP food stamp benefits. In addition, our data are used to inform dietary guidelines for Americans, the DGAs. And as we speak, DGA 2025 to 2030 are being developed and NHANES data are heavily relied upon to update these guidelines. Next slide. 
our data on food outlets, urbanization, and uh, participation in SNAP programs are very important in the context of social determinants of health and diet, and among other um, social determinants of health. Thanks. Next slide, please. Well, let's shift gears and talk now about future NHANES. Everybody would like to know more about where we are headed and a little bit more details on our NHANES 2025 and beyond. Next slide. We are working very hard with our new contractor, RTI International, and in planning NHANES 2025. And yes, NHANES will remain pretty much the same survey, population based approach including multi-mode data collection with in-home interviews, in-person exam at max with follow-up studies. Our survey content will continue to depend on funding and collaborators' needs. And as you know, we, in planning every upcoming cycle of NHANES, we solicit new content. And uh, upon reviewing the new, several proposals we received for NHANES 2025, we have these upgrades. Well, first, we excited that genetics will return to NHANES 2025, DNA uh, sampling and determination, genetic, genetics, et cetera. And then certain components such as vision, hearing, and spirometry will be coming back. And we are very excited to add nasal microbiome to our panel in 2025. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's expected to be different in NHANES 2025? Well, our maps will look different. We're gonna use trucks rather than trailers, and this will be more nimble, and we can move to more locations within a primary sampling unit, will be more accessible to our participants, and we hope to increase response rates with this approach. Uh, I would like to mention one change that will come up with this is that we will be using public use microdata area PUMAs instead of counties as primary sampling units. And this will also assist in getting us closer to the participants and again, increase it response rates, hopefully. Uh, second, we are going to decluster the sample. How? By going to more primary sampling units PSUs per year, about 20 each year. We will recruit fewer participants per household, and this should help increase statistical power, which we all want as we examine associations and describe estimates based on our data. Lastly, we will streamline processes with a shorter screener, new participant portal to return results. And next slide, please. And then here are a few ideas for future enhanced cycles. We'll incorporate additional records such as the EHR, pharmacy records, conduct some imaging of medicines, dietary supplements perhaps. Also we are looking at dietary assessment with potential improvements and new methods of oversampling to get it to small groups, uh, younger children, perhaps the elderly folks where many, many people are interested in knowing more about. Next slide. I would like to end by saying NHANES remains the cornerstone for monitoring nation's nutrition and health and to inform research and policies. This would not be possible without the continued support of our federal partners and our dedicated staff who make NHANES happen. Thank you very much. So we're going to introduce our next speakers now for the Rural Cohort Study. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Vasan Ramachandran, the founding dean and professor of medicine at the Long School of Medicine, and Frank Harrison, distinguished chair in public health at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. He is joined by Dr. Suzanne Judd, the director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy, and a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Welcome, Vasan and Suzanne. And thank you, Naman. I want to thank the NCHS organizers for inviting us to this panel. I'm happy to and privileged to present these slides along with my multiple principal investigator, Dr. Suzanne Judd. I want to acknowledge 
a vast number of principal investigators across 16 different institutions who have made this study possible. I also want to acknowledge the participants in the rural areas who contribute to this study to keep it alive. And last but not the least, I want to acknowledge the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, which is our funding agency. Next slide. There are no conflicts of interest that either I or Dr. Judd have to disclose. Next. There are four parts to our joint presentation. I will go over the first two parts, give you a little bit about the background that helped the rural study be born, talk a little bit about its aims and goals, and then hand over to my colleague, Dr. Judd, who will describe the general cohort design and end with a summary of the study. Next. So the very basis of the rural cohort study is that for the most of our history of our country, rural areas were healthier than urban areas, right? From the 1700s to the 1960s. Then in the 1970s, and what you see here schematically are all-cause death rates or mortality rates. You see that rural mortality rate starts escalating and urban mortality rate starts declining. And the urban areas today are healthier than the rural areas. Approximately 15% of the US population or 60 million people live in these rural areas. When you see a pattern like this, you can draw three inferences. One is that it's probably not the soil and the place because they were healthier in the past. It's probably not the people, you know, they were healthier in the past. And the third one is that this means that this is dynamic and therefore maybe mutable. We can change this. If you go to the next slide, this urban rural difference in mortality is actually increasing, especially over the last two decades. And that's of major concern. And that's one of the things that motivates the rural cohort study. Next. It, a related point to make is that when we talk about rural place, places, not all rural places are the same. Rural areas are pretty diverse and geographically nuanced. What we do know is that the select geographic regions where the rural areas have a higher burden of risk factors and disease. We talk about the stroke belt, the hypertension belt, the diabetes belt, the obesity belt, and they seem to cluster in that blob that you see over there, which is the Southeast. And a predominant burden of this is in the rural areas. When you see something of this kind of geographic pattern, the CDC often uses the word syndemics or cloak clustering, mutually reinforcing epidemics. And generally it means that there are common drivers. It's not the people, it's probably the context. Next slide. Rural health and mortality penalty is generally agnostic to race but the minoritized populations or people of color in the rural areas have much higher mortality rates than their white counterparts. That's what is shown here by the arrows. You can see black mortality rate in the urban area, black mortality in the rural areas. And you can see within a particular race, you see the gap between urban and rural. Next. So why, why would this happen? And there are usually several explanations that are given. And some of these are captured in the next few slides. The people living in rural areas are older and they also face more food insecurity. The proportion who are college educated is lower. And as you can link, we are talking about the social determinants of health over here. Next slide. They also face more economic challenges and behavior economic challenges. And you can take any measure. You can take per capita income, you can take overall poverty rates, you can take child poverty rates, and you can see the urban rural divide in this slide, that the rural areas face more economic challenges. Next slide. Likewise, it's not surprising with the social determinants adversely affecting, affecting the rural areas. The rural areas also have a higher burden of behavioral risk factors. Smoking rates are higher in the rural areas, including adolescent smoking. Physical inactivity is higher in the rural areas. Next slide. It's not surprising when you see the behavioral factors trending in that direction, that the burden of metabolic risk factors, such as excess weight, 
pre prevalence of diabetes mellitus or high blood pressure trend on the higher side in rural areas compared to the urban areas. Next slide. To contextualize this, it's also important to acknowledge that access to healthcare is lower in the rural areas. Whether you look at it as a metric, as physicians per 10,000 population, or you look at the overall uninsured rates. Next slide. So when you see this kind of pattern, where you see uh, social determinants of health adversely tracking, we refer to this as deficit-based thinking. And I want us to move forward to what we call as in parallel asset-based thinking about rural areas. Next slide. So the aim of the rural cohort study is to study what we refer to as the rural health and mortality penalty within courts. And this health and mortality penalty means that rural areas have overall lower lifespan. They also have a smaller health span that is time you spend in life free of multimorbidity. And the common hypothesis is that this is related to increased allostasis and adverse social determinants of health, and it manifests itself in mortality and morbidity um, penalties. Next slide. So the way rural has been structured, and my colleague will expand on this, not all rural areas are same. What we observed in our geospatial analyses is in the rural Southeast, in the Southern Appalachia and Mississippi Delta, they are often adjacent or nearby rural counties, equally economically challenged, similar demographics, and with very similar profile in terms of race and ethnicity. Yet, the mortality or the morbidity burden is very different using uh, CDC data, which begs the question, why are some rural areas thriving and others seem to have a high burden of disease? That is the hypothesis rural is testing. And how do we do that? We have an ecologically paired design that my colleague will expand upon. And what we are doing is at the individual level, deep phenotyping. We want to measure, make a number of measurements on the rural participants, but we also want to link it to data on neighborhoods, data on living conditions, data on environment from other sources. So that's what rural does, it marries individual level data and deep phenotyping with additional data sources that talk about context. Next slide, please. At this point, I'll hand over to Suzanne to talk about the design and end the talk. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is the overall picture of the various cores within the rural cohort study. We have um, several different phenotypes that we're studying, including pulmonary phenotypes led by Boston University. We have an imaging core um, that Hopkins and Duke are both a part of, as well as the Lundquist Institute. We're, we're, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the various things that we're collecting um, in a, a few more slides. But we also have biorepository at the University of Vermont. Uh, here at UAB, we recruit and then work with the participants to hope they stay with us for many, many decades to come. Every participant gets a cell phone and a Fitbit, and we have an mHealth core that's leading those efforts. The genomics core also at Lundquist is uh, working on some of the genetic data as we get it in. Led by Berkeley and Emory, we have the Social Determinants of Health Corps. As Vasan mentioned, this is a really important part of the study as we're looking at um, what are some of the social factors in these communities. An ECG Reading Center at Wake Forest University. Uh, the University of North Carolina is helping us with sampling and design of the study. And the Statistical Data Coordinating Center is at Penn. Uh, you just met Vasan. He's at Utesca in San Antonio, leading the study coordinating center. And, and overall, we're funded by NHLBI. You can see the group of investigators on the bottom slide. Next slide, please. So we're looking at 10 different counties across Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Louisiana. We have two counties each in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama with four counties in Kentucky, but they're really paired counties. They're, the counties that we've selected in Kentucky are a little bit smaller um, in terms of population than some of the other counties in the other states, and they're, they're side by side. So it's, it's actually only going to be two locations, even though it's four counties. Next slide, please. 
we're really focusing on the rural counties in the southeastern United States. And you can see it's a very broad definition of southeastern United States, everything from the Black Belt of Alabama to Appalachia of Kentucky, trying to understand what are these differences in rural communities that, that might be driving some of the um, disparities that Boston mentioned earlier. We have an ecologically paired design with some counties that are um, actually quite healthy and in most cases healthier than some urban communities and then some um, counties that have lower um, levels of, of um, heart health and, and lung health, sp specifically mortality were the indicators we had avail available to us at the time of the grant. One of the most important pieces of the project is community collaboration. Each state has a state PI that works with local community partners that are living in these areas, that are experiencing healthcare in these areas, so that we can get a real boots on the ground perspective from our community partners of, of what's happening and how is the science perceived? What are we doing well? What could we do differently? Um, how do we stay engaged in these communities so that we're not just studying them, but hopefully can also um, lead to some change in these areas? Next slide, please. This is a general flow of our, um, our protocol with the participants. It's very similar to what you heard about NHANES in terms of the, the truck goes out to the communities, our mobile uh, clinic goes out and the participants come to the mobile clinic, but it's, it's in their county. Uh, so it's, it's hopefully a little bit closer than uh, other clinics might be. We use address-based sampling to recruit the sample as well as um, sampling from community partners. It was really important. We learned this from day one. The community said, we want also to be able to volunteer people into the study. So we wanted to, to have the opportunity for volunteers as well as address-based sampling, which allows us to do some novel statistical techniques to, um, to make the sample representative back to the rest of the county. Once we have the sample, we recruit them by a telephone and a brief questionnaire. Uh, to, to bring them into the study and then, then bring them to the MEU. We call it a mobile examination unit. It's similar to the MEC that you heard about with N. Haynes. At the, the mobile examination unit, they have about a three hour visit uh, where they get a variety of um, heart and lung related um, phenotyping so that we can you know, have a deep phenotyping of, of each and every participant. We then leave them with a phone and a Fitbit. They take it home and wear it, um, and, and they answer some questions on their, their phone while they've got it for the next six months. We're hoping to hit about 4,600 people total as the study goes on. Next slide, please. This is an overall picture of what the unit looks like with the CT and the various pieces and parts of the, the mobile examination unit. Next slide, please. And this is the, the outside of the truck. Next slide, please. We have several different questionnaires that we can talk about later in the Q&A if people are interested, but this is an overall overview. And next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the phenotyping that we have in rural. Uh, we have AI-based echo, we have the biospecimen, we have CT, spirometry, uh, we have pulse wave velocity, and then again, those questionnaires. Next slide, please. And next slide, this is kind of just gonna scroll through those in depth so you can get a feel for what the, the various components are. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide. So you can see there's quite a lot that we're doing in this truck. Um, this gives you a feel for the, the questions we're asking on the app. We wanted to make sure not to overburden people in any one sitting. So we asked them some questions on the truck and then some 24 hours, seven days, one month, three months, and six months later. Next slide. We also are storing genomics um, so that we can do lots of different types of genetic testing, whether that's the chip-based GWAS with polygenic risk scores or um, later on some of the other gen genomic tools. We're just beginning to discuss some of these things in rural. Next slide. We are adjudicating endpoints, um, both through medical records, data linkages, uh, and also health history updates from all participants. Next slide. We have a committee that can look at all of these various sources to determine if the endpoints have happened in the study. And next slide. And now to the end of, my, of our talk, as we've talked about rural, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the highlights. Um, we're focusing on the health disparity in the populations of the rural Southeast. We've got that ecologically paired design. 
Um, we, we ran really quickly through the exam, but certainly happy to take questions toward the end. And our goal is to really be um, a doorway to implementation science in some of these communities um, that don't have as much access to academic medical centers. On the last slide is just a picture of our truck. And thank you for listening today. So next, uh, we have speakers from show. Uh, both speakers are at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Jamal Matthew, Director and Principal Director, invest, in, excuse me, Principal Investigator of Show. She is also the inaugural Chief of Biomedical Informatics and Associate Dean for Informatics and Information Technology. She's joined by Dr. Amy Schultz, Associate Director and Co-PI of Show. Uh, Jamal and Amy. Thank you so much, Dennis. I'm so thankful to NCHS for organizing this seminar and particularly to uh, Dennis and Naman for all the hard work that went into this. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about the survey of the health of Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So uh, we have organized the talk as I uh, will give you a background of, of show. We'll talk about the cohort data and specimens and the key activities that we have done, our accomplishments and our current focus. I'll be passing in between to Amy and she'll go over the data and specimen collections and our key activities and pass it back to me for wrapping up. So, um, uh, you know, NHANES uh, speakers set the stage for us. So show was actually modeled after the NHANES. Um, and it was started in 2008 by Dr. Javier Nieto, uh, who was the Population Health Science Department Chair at the time at University of Wisconsin. And like uh, many cross-sectional or longitudinal studies, this was not built around a specific epidemiological hypothesis um, or uh, meant to look at specific exposures or outcomes. Instead, it was to create, uh, like M. Haynes, you know, but at, at the state level, a representative longitudinal health examination survey and biobanking study. Our mission was particularly to support ongoing population health monitoring, research and education to promote health equity and well-being in Wisconsin and beyond. It was funded by the Wisconsin Partnership Program for a long time from 2004 to 2023. Next slide, please. So I won't be able to go in, in detail about the sampling frame because it in itself may take 15 minutes, but at a high level, we used state level address-based address sampling frame and two stage area probability sampling without replacement. But what I want to highlight is that, you know, in, in our selection um, of the sampling units and in our sampling approaches, we had incorporated um, in a per percentage of population give, living below the 100% federal poverty level such that we have enough representation of those individuals and household in our samples. So our primary sam sampling unit was census block groups in the first stage and in the later stages, when we got to 2014 and 16, we actually moved to counties as the uh, primary sampling units. And also when we got to that 2014 period, in addition to the poverty levels, we also incorporated percentage with minority population and mortality measures into our sampling strategies so that we have enough representation of people from various groups, um, you know, ethnically as well as um, um, also uh, from socioeconomic disadvantage perspectives. And in 2018-19, we wanted to increase the population specifically from African Americans and, um, and Hispanics. So we focused on sampling in, in the city of Milwaukee. Next slide, please. So this isn't just uh, what we have done. Uh, we have 20, 2008 to 2013, we focused on annual statewide representative samples. 2014 to 16, we changed it to triannual. Um, that was more uh, instigated by the funding and, and to uh, gain efficiency in the sampling. And then, uh, like I said before, 2018 to 19, we focused on city of Milwaukee. And with this, uh, next slide, please. 
we uh, this is where uh, we are. We have about more than 6,000 state residents, and uh, there are certain areas which had uh, 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 sovereign Indian nations uh, which were excluded unless explicitly permitted. So uh, as you can see, we have representation from most of the state of Wisconsin and uh, you know some higher uh, representation from specific areas that we are we were very interested in, like the Milwaukee and also uh, Dane County. Next slide, please. So as so uh, you know, let's look at with our sampling strategies where we are in terms of representation. So if you look at this slide, uh, what you have on the right side is the ACS um, data. And on the left side is the show population. So you can see that there is very close similarity between uh, you know, the, the two um, uh, data sets uh, in terms of sex, age, uh, race, education, and income levels. Next slide, please. So this is another measure of representativeness that we are so proud of. And uh, you know what you're seeing here um, is the area deprivation index, which is a cumulative measure of the deprivation of a neighborhood. This was developed by the uh, uh, the uh, HRSA first and adapted and validated to the census group levels by Dr. Amy Kind at University of Wisconsin. And this is an index, like I said, includes various factors like income, education, employment, and housing quality. And it allows a ranking of neighborhoods by socioeconomic disadvantage. So you can see that there's a lot of disadvantage like which are marked by the dark red areas. And they are well represented in our cohort, which you can see on the right side. And similarly, if you take a look at Milwaukee, there is a lot of difference and a and, uh, high concentration of uh, socioeconomic disadvantage. And those areas are very well represented in the show cohort on the right side also. Another peculiar feature, and uh, Vasin and the group um, you know, mentioned about the rural versus urban differences. So a significant proportion of uh, Wisconsin is rural. And that is very well reflected again in the cohort. 32% of the cohort uh, is actually uh, coming from rural areas. And we have a significant uh, proportion of African-American and Latinx community that's represented uh, who, who live in highest ADI quartile. So this is what makes show a very wealthy data set for the, the researchers who are focusing on Wisconsin-based uh, health disparity research, as well as um, environmental epidemiological research. And as we have recently opened it more to basic science researchers, they are thrilled about the ability to go in and do sample-based assessments like molecular tests and, and have their samples widely represented uh, by the state of Wisconsin. So uh, next slide. So with this, I'll pass to Amy to go over the data and biospecimens. Amy. Thank you. Yeah. So show data and biospecimen are collected via a multitude of methods. And as Jamal mentioned, they're modeled after NHANES. So a lot of our methodology will be reflected um, in what was presented earlier. So participants go through several different stages. The first being an in-home or at-the-home recruitment. So we visit their home and we recruit them at the home and screen them at their home. And then we have a trained interviewer go to their house and interview them via a computer-assisted personal interview system on a laptop as shown in the top picture. And we also ask participants to complete a self-administered questionnaire booklet, which they mail back to headquarters or provide to the interviewer at the home. In the home, we also conduct objective measurements such as height and weight, and blood pressure as seen on the bottom picture. And then we ask participants to provide biospecimen samples such as blood, urine, stool. And in the early stages, we used MET trucks. So very similar to the pictures shown by the Rural Health Study and then also in Haines. And in more recent years, we've moved to a model where we set up clinic sites at community centers in participants' neighborhoods. So they're closer, and more easily um, accessible. And it's also helped with forging community partnerships. 
Next slide. So this is an overview of the data and specimen that we collect that are in our biobank and also our data repository for researchers to use. We have stored plasma, serum, urine, extracted DNA, RNA. We also have a, a huge focus on environmental exposure and hazard in collection of specimen as well as survey data. Uh, we focus on microbiome collections. We have stool specimen as well as sequence data available and household high touch swabs, soil and dust available in our biorepository. In addition to some of the physical measurements I already mentioned, we have participants wear waist and wrist accelerometers for measuring physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And we capture lung function via spirometry devices. Then we have over 2,000 factors or variables um, collected via the surveys, interviews, and self-administered questionnaires. At the individual level, we have you know, very similar questions. Often, a lot of them are borrowed from NHANES or adapted. Um, on health history, family history, behaviors, alcohol, smoking, physical activity, diet, as well as experiences. We've added um, surveys early on that some other courts don't have on daily discrimination, events, lifetime discrimination, um, aspects of their neighborhood and neighborhood perceptions, how close is the nearest park to where you live. And then we capture household level data, pets in the home, do you have municipal water or private well water, do you use pesticides or insecticides in the home, et cetera. And then because all our residents are geocoded and participants consent to linkages spatially, we can spatially link to contextual factors and other built environment and social economic determinants. Next slide. So here we wanted to highlight some of the more recent key activities of our program. So over the last five years, we focused two of those years on longitudinally following up our cohort in 2017 and 2022, where we conducted the same surveys and biospecimen collection again. We also do the ancillary studies. So in COVID-19, you know, the early years in 2020 and 2021, we did three waves of longitudinal COVID-19 impact survey. Um, all past adults in our cohort were invited to participate. And then we also conducted antibody and COVID-19 surveillance for the state health department. So we're a huge asset for the state health department. We were able to really get a pulse on where COVID-19 is in the state, but also in our oversampling in Milwaukee and African-American, Black and Latino communities. And it really helped the state health department allocate resources accordingly. And then more recently this past year, we did recontact of our cohort for cohort maintenance, getting updated email address and their preferred modality for recruitment moving forward. Next slide. So here's an overview of our response rates. Everyone always asks about this. So early on at baseline, among the sampling that Jamal just went over, we had a roughly 58 to 64% participate who were recruited from our address-based sampling approach. When we follow up our cohort, we have 80 to 86% participate, which we're really proud of. That's quite high for our type of survey. And then for the COVID-19 ancillary study, we had some more participation rates, 46 to 63%. Um, mostly we believe this is due to the restriction in modalities for recruitment and survey design due to the pandemic and some other pandemic related factors. Still really good turnout for that. Next slide. So just a summary, I just wanted to recap the data and specimen, in particularly the top table really highlights the number of unique individuals and what specimen we have in our biobank that's available per cycle of show. And at the bottom, you can see um, just reemphasizing, we have just under 6,000 adults in our cohort, just under 1,000 minors. And then for baseline stored DNA and specimen, we have just over 4,000 adults. We have about 1,000 adults with longitudinal survey data and just under 800 with longitudinal stored specimen for analysis for researchers to use. Next slide. So then what are the key activities show does? Well, really we're here to conduct research studies in biomonitoring and public surveillance activities. And we're often acting as consultants to help investigators run prospective and retrospective studies. Prospective studies on our cohort and following them up, and we help with all aspects of research from sampling design to data collection and recruitment of underrepresented populations, but also new recruitment of new participants. And then, of course, we get a lot of data and specimen requests from investigators, and we have the ability to do data linkages both spatially but also registry based. We recently 
um, linked to the cancer registry, our cohort. And then of course we help with statistical analysis as well. So I'm gonna hand this back over to Jamal and you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Amy. So um, I probably don't have the time to go over all the accomplishments, but like any, any study of this measure, we have a significant number of publications that have come out of it, several ancillary projects completed um, and, and funding as well as uh, collaborators. But what I want to highlight is the collaboration with our community and state partners. And I think uh, there was a specific question about community partnerships and we had a community advisory uh, boards or, or cabs, and uh, they helped um, engage the uh, the area uh, the uh, people from those areas. So um, and and that helped in help you know working with the state and answering some of the questions that uh, the state agencies are interested in, and also um, you know helping with um, several policies that the state was implementing and also monitoring conditions. For example, uh, one of the things that we did was uh, helping the state with the radon monitoring. Um, so um, those kinds of activities were possible only because we had this cohort for such a long time and the presence in the communities. Next slide, please. So one achievement that I want to highlight is from the get-go, show had placed heavy emphasis on return of results. And we returned individual level lab results uh, to the participants. And uh, that is probably one of the reasons why we have such a high response rate we, when we reach out to the same cohort again and again for several studies or also to continue our longitudinal work. And uh, you know what has happened in, in the past is two participants have explicitly called us and reported uh, their, uh, their cancer diagnosis because of the blood tests that were done use, uh, in a through show program. So uh, that's a huge matter of pride for us. And uh, you know, another uh, way that we interact constantly with the participants is through quarterly paper and e-newsletters. These include program updates, research findings, dissemination of various kinds of results and other information. So this has kept the cohort engaged and uh, next slide. So um, right now, because of COVID and other reasons, we felt that we really need to go back and engage with all the participants from the beginning of show. So we have started reaching out to them. We are about halfway through. We are using mail, a mail serve, uh, questionnaire as well as emails uh, and phone calls when it's difficult to reach people. So part of the reason why we want to do this is also to see, because we want to actually engage or leverage some of the technology-based sample, you know, uh, data collection to reduce the cost because physical, uh, you know, uh, on-premise, um, uh, collection of data is always expensive. So, but at the same time, we don't want to do that recklessly. We don't want to do that for the sake of technology. So, um, so we want to see what will work. And so that's why we want to see how many of the people are have actually emails that they'll respond to, how many of them are better off with phone calls, how many of them are better off with mailed uh, or, or paper-based collections. So th th those are the reasons why we are doing this now. And we are, uh, like I said, about halfway through. And with that, uh, again, you can see that out of the um, 2,464 reached, uh, 2,320 have um, you know, information. Um, so far. So um, again, that that shows the engagement of the, the community. We are hoping to complete this by uh, the end of December uh, or by the end of the year. So um, next slide. So um, our current focus is um, we are harmonizing the data across all the years, and we want to establish um, a data commons uh, to to accomplish two things. Number one, we want to actually promote the utilization by our basic research scientists who primarily depend on hospital-based samplings. About 15 years of my career in the past has been focused on hospital-based data. 
And so as any one of you might know, there's a lot of bias when we are particularly looking at uh, the, the population that's coming to a major academic center and trying to use that as a basis for real world evidence. So we think that this is one of the very good data sets for the investigators who are interested in, uh, again, looking at rural, looking at environmental uh, issues, and then connecting it to molecular basis of diseases. And so um, we, we want to popularize it, and that's why we are establishing this data commons. We also want to actually popularize this data set outside of the University of Wisconsin. So our uh, methods will help uh, provide this data to external researchers and also provide this as a cohort that's widely available to not just um, University of Wisconsin, but also people outside. So that is our current focus. Next slide. So I want to uh, acknowledge our uh, show team, the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine Public Health Leadership, um, Department of Population Health Sciences, our Wisconsin Partnership Program, who has been funding this for a long time, and also UW Carbon Cancer Center, who is partnering with us now to actually focus on uh, cancer community-based studies. Um, so I'll end there and pass it back to Dennis. So next, uh, we have speakers from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Ann Schuster, uh, Healthy New York City Panel Manager in the Bureau of Epidemiology Services, and Sharon Perlman, Senior Director of Special Projects. Both are from the Division of Epidemiology. So um, Ann and Sharon, please. Thanks, Dennis. Um, and thank you for inviting us to talk today. Anne and I are gonna be talking about three projects that we've been involved on and, and we'll give an overview of each. Uh, next slide, please. So first I'll be talking a little bit about two NYC Haines studies. One was conducted in 2004 and the more recent one in 2013-14. And the more recent one was a partnership with the City University of New York and it was funded by several foundations, including the DeBeaumont Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson, Robin Hood, New York State Health Foundation, and Doris Duke. Next slide, please. So we had several goals in conducting the second NYC Haines. We were interested in the prevalence of selected health conditions. It was an address-based sample, and the sampling design was similar to the National Haines study, although I won't go into detail about that here. Um, and the value is, of, of, as many of you recognize, of using objective measures so that you can diagnose, um, uh, you can recognize both diagnosed and undiagnosed diseases and environmental exposures. Um, so we wanted to monitor changes in the health status of adult New Yorkers across the time, two time periods. We wanted to use the more recent data to evaluate the effects of some citywide initiatives, um, such as a ban against trans fats and some of our uh, anti-tobacco initiatives, limiting smoking in bars and restaurants and later in beaches and public areas. Um, and, and one interesting thing is that we used um, electronic health record and we um, got population estimates from electronic health records and we compare them with NYC estimates, NYC Haines estimates as a way of trying to validate uh, those EHR records to see how close they were to our gold standard, which we considered NYC Haines. Um, as other studies, we have a biorepository from both years. We have uh, stored blood and urine, which has been used by uh, external researchers for a number of studies. Next slide, please. So our study design, it had several components. And the time it took for a participant was about two, two and a half hours. It had a brief physical exam. It had a face-to-face -face interview, a computer-assisted self-interview for more sensitive topics, the specimen collection, as I mentioned. Um, we had four primary languages, and then we also had a language line to help people who spoke languages other than those four. Um, in 2013-14, one of the new things we did was that we had interviews mainly in the home. So in 2004, we used primarily clinic sites that the health department had, but in, in the more recent one, we uh, interviewed the majority of participants in the home, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Uh, so there was IRB approval by the many institutions that were involved. Um, and the data was primarily collected by a vendor, RTI, and then the last uh, 10 weeks or so, CUNY and the health department did some additional data collection to increase our sample size. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the questionnaire about 2004 and the more recent NYC Haynes. Uh, you can see it's a wide range of topics, topics, including demographics, health insurance, access to care, sexual behavior, um, and report of diagnosis of medical conditions, as well as screening tools looking at different mental health symptoms. Next slide, please. So in the more recent NYC Haynes, we had 1527 participants. The majority of those were done at home, 82%. Um, most people pro provided biological samples with 80% providing blood and 90 95% urine and saliva. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are some of the laboratory analyses that we did, um, measures of diabetes, heart disease, infectious diseases like hepatitis, environmental exposures such as mercury, lead, cadmium, and codeine, um, which is a nicotine byproduct and um, indicates exposure to secondhand smoke, as well as kidney function and our repository. And the pictures there, um, the, the top one is someone from the health department's public health laboratory who is processing our specimens for us. Uh, it was really a tremendous effort on their part. And then the, the bottom picture is uh, freezers um, also at the public health laboratory where our biospecimens are stored. Next slide, please. So some lessons we, we learned in doing this. Um, so in New York City, as, as all of you know, is a very diverse city with many different languages and communities and um, cultural traditions. Uh, so it was very important for our entire team to be aware of that and to be sensitive and, and mindful of that as we were going into the field. Um, the staff supervisors and the interviewers are really key to the, the study and they really know best what's going on. So um, it, we, tried our best to listen to them and provide support to the whole team. And CDC really did a tremendous job with technical support and this effort and, and guiding us in best practices. Um, one of the challenges, which may be somewhat unique to large urban areas like New York, is that we have a lot of high rise buildings which are um, regulated by doormen. And often we found that the doormen weren't too keen on letting the interviewers into the building. Um, some of our interviewers were very skilled in establishing trust and getting into the buildings on the left. And in other cases, we sent letters to management and we tried to explain the study um, and, uh, and tried uh, different techniques to, to try and get into those buildings so that we could engage with participants that had been selected. But that, that was one of the difficulties. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we primarily did interviews in the home. Um, this was very well received. It was easier for people to reduce their burden. It did require a lot of coordination of our field staff and um, just collecting and processing the lab specimens was quite challenging. Uh, the picture there is a centrifuge, which is securely uh, strapped to a car seat actually. Um, we had to make sure that when we spin this, well, when the interviewers were spinning those specimens that it was safe and that it was a flat surface um, and that those specimens were processed in a timely manner so that the test results would be valid. So all of those things were a little bit challenging, um, but we, we managed to address that in most cases. Next slide. Please. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about some more recent work that um, Anne and I, and a lot of people in the Division of Epidemiology at the Health Department have been working on in the last three years. Uh, that's our NYC Health Panel, and it's a survey panel that we launched in the spring of 2020, which was the beginning of COVID. Um, we wanted to move a lot of our survey work in-house so that we'd have a little bit more control over it and leveraging some of our in-house expertise. Um, so our goals were to maintain the probability-based panel of adult New Yorkers uh, for ongoing uh, population health surveys um, and to try and do this in an efficient and cost-effective way and to serve as a resource for the agency um, for the foreseeable future. 
So we have about 10,000 active members in our cohort right now. We are expanding and doing a couple of different recruitments, and we expect to be about 30,000, um, maybe up to 40,000 people in the next year. Next slide, please. So why did we want to do a survey uh, panel? As many of you know, response rates for telephone surveys and really all surveys has decreased quite a bit um, in the last 10 years or so. And that's been really challenging and has made surveys more costly. Um, and a panel is um, has been more cost effective to us. Um, we've had pretty good participation rates and have been able to maintain most of our cohort. Um, and it's also been nice that we've had a lot more control and than in some of our previous projects where we've had a vendor uh, do some of the things for us. Um, but it's certainly been a lot of work and it's been a lot of um, in-kind contribution of our staff and um, some CDC funding. Next slide, please. Uh, so our panel recruitment, um, it was primarily an address-based sample. Um, we initially invited people by mail. We did invite a small group from previous probability-based uh, surveys that we had done. And for some of those people, we had text and email addresses. So we invited them uh, by those means if we had it. Uh, we used the next birthday method. Um, we reached out to people up to five times. We offered a survey in several different languages and um, we've offered a paper option at, at some points. And right now we're offering a phone option as an alternative to people who prefer not to take it on the internet. Um, it is pushed to web and for registration, we've offered a $20 incentive. And for most subsequent surveys, we've offered a $10 incentive. Next slide, please. Uh, just a picture of some of our mailed invitations. Um, if you could click through one more time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's an example of the letter. It's uh, addressed to dear fellow New Yorker. It explains the study, how to take the study. Um, it was signed by the commissioner with a QR code. Uh, if you could click once more. It's um, in multiple languages um, so that people can uh, uh, get a brief sense of the study and get more information either through the QR code or through the link um, and participate. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn it over to Anne. Thanks, Sharon. I'll just wrap up our discussion of this, our New York City surveys by sharing some of the successes and challenges that we've had with the health panel, and then sharing a little bit about the serological surveys we completed as part of our COVID response. So after, over the last three years, we've conducted 27 surveys on a range of health issues using the New York City health panel. Topics range from our quarterly health opinion polls, which capture information about public opinion and behavior related to emerging health issues, to surveys conducted last year on food and energy insecurity, to a recent survey that captured data on the reproductive health of people assigned female at birth in New York City. Next slide, please. Throughout all of these surveys, we've maintained an average um, participation rate of around 40%. Um, and we're really proud that we've been able to provide population level estimates on these important health topics in a quick timeline. This was especially useful during the pandemic when we used the health panel to capture data quickly on vaccine uptake and intentions, pandemic behavior, and to facilitate the collection of biospecimens for serological testing. Um, these successes, though, haven't come without difficulties. We've often experienced challenges procuring gift cards and securing contracts in a timely manner. Um, but so far, we've been able to adapt to all of these challenges based off of our strong team of survey administrators and analysts. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Well, that's fine. <laughs> um, I want to pivot a little bit to talk about some of our uh, COVID-19 response. And now you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So in early 2020, we launched two surveys to help us better understand the scope of COVID-19 transmission across the city. Uh, if you can click once. Uh, we launched these surveys because we knew that laboratory testing was only capturing a fraction of the total number of infections. The first survey that we conducted, which I won't spend a lot of time on today, 
included a series of questions about symptoms and aimed to estimate additional symptomatic cases that were not being reported through laboratory testing. The survey was always conducted ahead of the CR survey and responses from the two surveys can be linked. Click again, please. The second survey was the series of serological surveys, which aimed to better understand overall spread, including symptom asymptomatic and mild cases of the disease. Next slide. <clears throat> we first conducted, uh, well, we conducted the first three surveys in rapid succession from June 2020 until October 2021. For these first three surveys, participants were recruited from other population health surveys, including the New York City Health Panel. Those agreeing to participate were called by a contracted phlebotomy vendor who scheduled a time to visit participants' homes and draw their blood for testing at the New York City Health Public Health Laboratory. For the first two surveys, respondents' results were returned to them, um, but we did stop this practice in early 2021 because of the diminished personal utility of results just indicating whether or not somebody was seropositive. Next slide. Over time, we saw improved participation from just under 500 specimens that we were able to capture in the summer of 2020 to over 1,000 in the summer of 2021. Um, this improved our ability to um, provide population-based estimates um, because we were able to rely solely on serological samples towards the end instead of also re relying on self-reported antibody results. Next slide. Um, however, we did experience uh, quite a few challenges with using our in-home phlebotomy approach. Uh, unsurprisingly, and as I think Sharon mentioned earlier, we had trouble recontacting many, recontacting many of those people who indicated an interest in participating because they are unwilling or uninterested in answering phone calls from our phlebotomists whose calls often came from numbers that were registered outside of New York City. Um, we also found that not all participants actually wanted to participate, and many weren't comfortable with a stranger coming into their home during the pandemic period. We experienced other issues like safety concerns for the phlebotomists um, and increasingly trouble parking and scheduling with participants as some of the pandemic restrictions eased. These challenges contributed to a larger or a somewhat large average lag time between health survey completion and the specimen collection, which complicated some of our analyses. Next slide, please. So after the third zero survey, we reassessed our approach and decided to deploy a different data collection process for the fourth and final survey. In 2022, we collected specimens through the mail. Um, all potential participants were sent a blood collection kit in the mail, which they used to collect their own blood. Um, and they then mailed this to our partner laboratory at the New York State Department of Health at Wadsworth. Next slide. This new approach allowed us to increase our sample to nearly 1,400 returned specimens. Although not all specimens were usable, um, we were able to improve the overall quality of our data set by now excluding specimens that were returned more than 60 days after participants um, took that population health survey. Next slide. Ultimately, conducting these SARA surveys taught us that we had the capacity to collect biospecimens in-house at the Department of Health, um, but it did highlight the logistical challenges to making this happen and the importance of having a really strong team, um, both at the Department of Health and at our partner institutions like the Public Health Laboratory and, and Wattsworth. Next slide. And so thank you very much for uh, having us here today.